it's absolutely wonderful being here. Uh, and to share a few thoughts, some of which are a little provocative. Uh, so be, and when I say provocative, I'm not saying it lightly. I mean it very, very seriously. Uh, firstly, a lot of what John, Sir John Hegarty has said resonated quite a bit because that's also the core and central theme for my book. It's almost, I'm saying that marketing as we know it is dead. We have to totally and completely reimagine and reinvent marketing. I'll just give you some glimpses into the, all that and I'll tell you why I feel that way and what we need to do about it and share a few examples of how we are trying to bring some concepts of those to life uh, with a company that I work for, which is MasterCard. Uh, so, to just start, first and foremost, when you look at the field of marketing, marketing has been around forever, right? More than 2,000 years back, uh, it was discovered, evidence of marketing was discovered in the ruins of Pompeii, where advertisements for political candidates extolling their virtues were put on the walls of homes of people who are very wealthy, or whose homes were located in the high traffic areas. So they did have the concept of targeting. They did have the concept of location-based marketing even way back then. You can call it elementary and rudimentary, but it was always there. The first paradigm of marketing which lasted the longest was all about essentially trying to say that you have a great product, create a fantastic product that works better than anyone else, you package it very attractively, you price it reasonably, and you make it available very easily. So basically the four P's of marketing. You do that, you're golden. You'll become the market leader. Why? Because after all, people are logical in their thinking and rational in their actions. Now this was the presumption that existed for the most period of time. But somewhere marketers discovered the joys of psychology sociology, anthropology, and they discovered that no, people are not logical in their thinking. They are not rational in their behavior. Quite to the contrary, they are emotional beings. They are driven by feelings. Their actions are driven by feelings. So you need to arouse, or arouse those feelings and emotions in people to influence their choices in favor of your brand or your company. That is emotional marketing, right? And the ability to arouse these emotions or arouse these emotions comes through storytelling. So the second paradigm of marketing was all about storytelling. And the advent of two great technologies, the radio and the television, have really given, enabled marketers the ability to tell stories in a compelling fashion that moves the hearts and they will actually take actions in your favor. Mid-1990s, was the revolution of the internet and also of data analytics. When data analytics came in and when the uh, World Wide Web has come about, marketing changed completely and it moved to the third paradigm of marketing. We have now digital marketing in that paradigm. You have got precision marketing. You had measures of return on investment in a very precise fashion and so on. And in 2007, marketing moved from the third to the fourth paradigm. And this was with the advent of iPhone, where mobile phones were become really very functional, extremely user-friendly, very ubiquitous, and literally I keep joking that the mobile phone, if you look at the Darwinian theory of evolution, mobile phone is the latest organ that the human being has developed. You wake up with it, you are looking at it thousands of times throughout the day, and then you're sleeping with it, and God forbidding, if you wake up in the middle of the night, you need to see what's happening on your phone. That's how addictive it is, right, on the one hand. And you have got social media. That was a second revolution at the same time when Facebook has scaled, and social media has changed again. Between social and mobile, marketing has gone through a major transformation. That was the beginning of mobile marketing, social media marketing, influencer marketing, location-based marketing. Each time marketing was moving through a paradigm, it was essentially driven by a couple of technologies. But right now, we are at the verge of an unprecedented level of technological revolution that's coming upon us. Not two technologies, but two dozen technologies. 
you got artificial intelligence, you got augmented reality, virtual reality, the whole metaverse that you're talking about. You got the blockchains, autonomous driving vehicles, internet of things, wearables, the list goes on and on and on. 5G communications, 3D printing. Every one of these technologies is independently capable of disrupting people's lives and therefore marketing. Just imagine the confluence of these 24 technologies, what it is going to do to us. Marketing will absolutely never be the same. So if you were to look at the uh, three areas which are going to define the new paradigm, as I call the fifth paradigm, number one, this technology, the tsunami of technologies. The second is the data deluge, right? Today we think that there is too much of data, but when you have internet of things and wearables, every damn device is connected right from your toothbrush to your toilet. Yes, there are connected toilets already. <laughs> uh, what they measure, don't ask me, but they, are, they do measure a uh, whole bunch of things. So th when everything is connected, what does it mean? Each one of these devices is either gathering data or it is putting out data somewhere into the cloud. And as it is, people feel very constrained in terms of, oh my God, my privacy is being compromised, am I being watched, am I being stalked, and so on. Now imagine what will happen in the future. There is a complete deluge of data. The third one is the cultural shifts. Whether it is Black Lives Matter kind of things which are really coming to the fore now in, the, in places like United States, or you're talking about LGBTQE. If you talked about LGBTQE and an initiative around it 15 years back, you'd be trashed. But today, it's actually welcomed, and we have done some fantastic initiatives I feel very proud of, targeted at that community and for serving that community. Now, there are cultural shifts which are extraordinary that we are in the midst of. So between the technology revolution, the data uh, revolution, and the cultural shifts that are happening, marketing is never going to be the same. Now, every aspect of marketing, I say, is actually going to change. For example, how we get insights today is absolutely mindless. You ask people to tell you why they are behaving the way they are behaving, why they have made a choice. If you look at most of the decisions of people are subconscious. When decisions are subconscious, you are asking people to give a rational answer. What you get is post-rationalization. You don't really get insights. Technology has evolved. Now you can actually track what's happening in different parts of the brain, call it neuroinsights. And it gives you a very different layer of understanding. Insights is going to be revolutionized. If you look at advertising, I keep saying advertising as we know it is dead. Uh, like, uh, you know, uh, again, Sir John was mentioning, who likes advertisements? I hate them. I'm sitting in front of a digital uh, screen and trying to watch some YouTube videos. And every three minutes, there's a stupid ad that comes to destroy my experience. Right? And I'm waiting for that skip now button and I had to wait for five full seconds. And to make my life even more difficult, now YouTube serves me two advertisements. Add one of two and two of two, and I can only skip one of them. That, that's like, you know, when we as marketers talk about consumers' lives to be improved, their experience to be delightful, seamless, frictionless, we as marketers are destroying their experience. We're introducing friction into their experience. That's not smart. So what happens? People are leaving in droves, on the one hand, to add free environment like Netflix, and you've got Amazon Prime and so on. And it's in significant numbers. Netflix alone, last year, beginning, had more than 200 million subscribers who are watching billions and billions of hours of video, which means that time of our, their attention is now not available to marketers. Likewise, if you look at uh, uh, what do you call these digital channels or the screens, the ad blockers which are being put, it's being done at scale. You have got more than 800 million ad block users at this point in time active. Asia is actually leading the way in that front. They are saying, you marketing guys, we hate you. Don't come into my territory. I'm happy the way I am without your help. So when advertising is going in this way and people are paying money to be in an ad-free environment, you need to realize and understand how advertising is going to be. You know, the need for communicating doesn't uh, stop but the way we are communicating is wrong. Therefore, I say advertising as we know it is dead. Loyalty, I'll give you this something which, if anyone of you are from a slightly conservative background, please bear with me. I did a survey on bbc.com a few years back, three years back. They did a survey amongst married couple 
and live in people who are living uh, in relationships. They ask them, how many of you have cheated on your partners or on your spouses? Uh, any guess what the number would have been? Zero. Somebody says zero. <laughs> how many would have? Any second guess? How much? 40%. Okay. 70% of the people have admitted that they have cheated on their partners or spouses. And a further 15% said, if I'm sure I will not get caught, <laughs> I'll go, okay? So you're talking about 85% of the people are not hardwired for loyalty. Okay, I'm not passing a value judgment. But as a marketer, now you think about it, as an industry, we spend more than a trillion dollars running loyalty programs. <laughs> and we expect people to be loyal to our brands because you're giving some one mile free. Just get real, right? <laughs> so let, let's put that. So I think we need, not I think, we absolutely have to rethink our whole framework. It's not loyalty. What we want is repeat purchase. What we want is stickiness. Don't confuse it with loyalty. If you start with the presumption of loyalty, you completely travel on a wrong path. You need to figure out what you do is preferential management. And the platforms, the tech stacks, the creativity, everything is very different. And so I can go area by area. Like you know, when you talk of purchase funnels, you talk of awareness, interest, desire, action, satisfaction. We used to have those nice little funnels. There is no funnel that works today. Everything is absolutely collapsed, and it can go in different directions, right? In this level of marketing disruption, what we need is a new way of approaching marketing completely. In the world of physics, physics is the uh, science with which you try to understand how things work around you in your physical environment. And uh, whether it is theory of uh, what you call gravity, the laws of motion, the law of electricity and magnetism and so on. But when humanity discovered outer space or subatomic spaces, classical physics could not handle that phenomena. So a new uh, field of physics was born called quantum physics by Max Planck. And that really has helped advance our thinking and move physics to a different level altogether. And that's the basis now for a lot of what we do, whether it is quantum computing, whether you talk about uh, satellites and all kinds of things, right? Now, in the same way for me, classical marketing is not going to be able to handle marketing, is not going to be able to handle the new environment, which is the fifth paradigm. We need to have a different way, which is what I call as quantum marketing. And whether it is tons of AI, whether it is you know, metaverse, behavioral economics, real-time actions, neuropower, multi-sensory, whole bunch of things, it's gonna be fascinating. That's what my whole book is about, and hopefully you'll read it because you're getting it free. So, <laughs> I, I think that's the least expectation, right? So, but just to give you one sliver of this, which is what I call as multi-sensory. So multi-sensory marketing is just one aspect of it. If you look at people, normally people are blessed with five senses. The, the sense of sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell. But as marketers, we only rely on two senses, which is the sense of sight and the sense of sound. Why? Because we automatically predetermine that my category is not suitable for the other senses. If I have to do a credit card, for example, uh, and I want to use the sense of taste, are we going to give them edible credit cards? How does it work? Okay, so it's, people are very quick to not be imaginative, to give smart aleck answers and stop themselves from progressing. So what we try to do is firstly, uh, from each one of these sites, uh, each one of these senses, firstly we say let's look at the sense of uh, uh, what you call sight. Sense of sight, it's fascinating that we do a very substandard job as an industry. Colors, different shades of colors have profound impact on feelings and emotions. We don't optimize them. There are ways now you can study using technology. You can optimize them for the medium, you can optimize it for the, uh, uh, what you call mood, and the feelings of the person that you want to engender. And secondly, from it, when you talk of visual sense, people are actually more receptive to pictures. A picture is worth a thousand words, we have always said that. Pictures and symbols, but we rely heavily on 
other things, which is words, et cetera. So one of the key things that we have done in this space is totally revamping our entire brand structure, brand architecture, and make it very visually optimized for the digital screens, as well as for impact and appeal. And we actually got rid of the name MasterCard from our logo altogether and launched what we call a symbol brand. It has done a profound amount of good. Uh, I cannot go into the details on this right now because of time shortage, but, but hopefully you'll get to see that. Likewise, sound. Jingles have been around forever, but jingles are so suboptimal. There have been mnemonics which have been used by companies like Intel brilliantly, till the reason why I don't know why they have dropped it, but that's a brilliant, brilliant sonic signature that they had. And there are companies like British Airways which have used melodies that play in the background. But what I found very, very interesting is there isn't any brand that is actually looking at every aspect of sound and to optimize it. So we started writing our own playbook. It took us more than two years to come up with our whole sonic branding architecture. And in two years time, coming from nowhere, now we have been rated as the world's number one audio brand, beating McDonald's till then, they were the number one. And, and it's a fantastic kind of a, uh, you know, uh, it's very, uh, at one level commonsensical, second it's highly scientific. And so this is the second area, and I'm not going through the whole thing at this point in time. But one point I want to mention on this sound is, we have actually, uh, we're going to release our first music album called Priceless. Uh, and you should actually ch check out one of those songs we have already put on YouTube, and we're going to launch it pretty soon uh, uh, in, in the next less than eight weeks time. So hopefully you'll enjoy that. And it's already become the one song we created for Latin America became number one, top of the charts, uh, across 12 countries in Latin America. So this is basically the power of sound, the power of music, and how you credibly, authentically uh, connect it to your brand and brand identity and creating the right values and the right imagery. That's something fascinating. Taste. So the way we interpret it, taste is how do you give tasteful uh, uh, culinary experiences to consumers? We launched uh, restaurants. Now we are in restaurants business. Not to make money, but to enhance the brand and curate experiences that money cannot buy, but you get them if you have a MasterCard. That's a whole uh, premise, right? And uh, two restaurants we have launched very recently post-pandemic, one in Sao Paulo in Brazil, the other one is in Mexico City. Uh, in, in moments after we launched, they got just sold out in less than a few minutes, literally, uh, for seven months in advance, because that's all the reservation uh, system was capable of taking. And it's a new revenue stream, but that revenue will be plowed back into our efforts. We also created macarons uh, with Ladure, uh, the French baker, and uh, we actually sell it at various places. And uh, it's been a very different kind of a manifestation for an otherwise abstract brand which does not have tangible products to bring it to the realm of uh, uh, what you call tangibility. We also launched fragrances. Uh, and we use these scents at all our offices, in our event spaces, uh, and uh, it was sold actually. My, I know I'll mutilate the name of the retailer because of my strong Indian accent, and this retailer is an Italian, La Renishanti, I believe, uh, in Milan. So we actually launched it there pre-Christmas, and uh, these fragrances have, are doing extremely well. Now we don't know how to manage the demand and hopefully we'll reach out to one of you folks in the uh, packaged goods industry to seek your help uh, because we are not good at producing fragrances and distributing them. So hopefully we'll have some partnerships set up. Uh, but this is the kind of stuff that we are trying to do, tapping into different things. But I wanted to focus on one sense, which is the fifth and the, uh, the most recent one. So uh, when we looked at how can we leverage the sense of touch for our campaigns, what we realized is there is a huge opportunity. Now, I grew up in India, uh, and when I was growing up as a child, my grandmother used to live with us, and she was blind. Uh, she went blind, actually, and uh, so we had to literally help her navigate the whole home, uh, which was very tedious for her, and it used to make me feel very sad. Even, for example, when she sits, when she sits at the table, we need to show her where the plate is, where what, so she could actually uh, you know, go about eating her food. It's simple things. So we started wondering, how do blind people use their cards? How do they know the front of the card from the back of the card? How do they know where there is a chip? Because you are supposed to insert the chip into the uh, slot uh, of the point of sale terminal, or you have to tap it, how are you tap? And how do they know which is a MasterCard versus any of the competitors? How do they know it's a debit card or a credit card? 
So when we started looking at this whole problem, we took it and then just take a look at the video uh, and that'll tell you how we have done it. Find a seat. Good girl. I was born legally blind. For millions of visually impaired people, paying with a card can be a challenge. Credit cards used to have raise numbers and now they're unfortunately losing that tactileness. Which one is my credit card? Now I have to get somebody else to go through my cards to pick out this one. I've been in situations where all of the store clerks are just standing in a circle waiting for me to figure out where my card is. It can be exhausting. But what if cards could be identified by touch? Huh. Oh, wow. This is wonderful. <laughs> Introducing TouchCard by MasterCard. Three distinctly shaped notches help people tell the difference. Okay, we have an indent here. It's like got uh, notches. All three of them have notches. Yeah, I'll be able to tell my cards apart. Developed in partnership with Idemia, Visions, and the Royal National Institute of Blind People. This touch card is going to change my whole approach to the way I shop. They're just little things like that can go a long way as far as bringing independence to a blind person. Inclusive by design and a step forward for the entire industry. Because a world designed for all of us is priceless. Just a little notch is huge progress. Thank you, thank you very much. You know, we thought we produced a great video. And I think I always, each time I see it, I feel very, very, I get goosebumps. But then what we realized is, how does a blind person see this? Think about it, right? If you're a blind person, so what we did is for the first time in the advertising world, I believe, that's what we'd like to believe. If I'm wrong, don't blame me, just enjoy the video. This commercial was designed with audio description for people who are blind or partially sighted so more people can experience it. A red-haired woman holds a white cane and feels her way down apartment steps. She strolls past a man scrubbing his vintage sports car. Love the music, Rick. Good morning, Marjorie. Good morning. Marjorie tilts her head. What's that sound? A shopping cart? Hey, Marjorie. It's her friend on a skateboard. Hey, Marcus. Nearby, kids play soccer. Marjorie steps into a tiny cafe. Hey, Marjorie. Hi, Mayogi. Vanilla latte, please. Okay, 450. Someone shuffles impatiently behind her. Marjorie isn't flustered. All cards used to feel the same, but touch cards from MasterCard have distinct notches for debit, credit, and prepaid. She feels a half hexagon, a credit card. She taps a terminal and takes her latte. Thank you. She steps outside and strides away from us. Touch cards appear, each with a distinct notch. Introducing Touch Card by MasterCard, because a world designed for all of us is priceless. The word priceless comes up next to the MasterCard logo. Thank you. When, when we tested it out amongst the blind uh, audiences, this was really, uh, I would say, most gratifying experience, I would say, uh, in all my stint at MasterCard, and it was fantastic for us. See, one is, one of the most important aspects uh, when you look at the fifth paradigm is, you know, he was, uh, I think Connie was mentioning about value and values. That is so true, and I think purpose-drivenness is very critical. But there's a lot of confusion in people's mind as to what is purpose and what is cause marketing. They're not the same. Purpose is your North Star. Cause marketing, the causes that you decide to support, are your roadmaps. So the roadmaps which will lead you towards your purpose is what purpose marketing is. Now, one of the areas which instantly appealed uh, when I was interacting with uh, Stefan Lorke uh, is about uh, the planet. Saving the planet is extreme. And I'm a trained environmental engineer by education. So we created something about what we called at MasterCard as priceless planet. 
uh, and we contributed uh, uh, boatloads of money for this, and we are still doing it. But more importantly, we are leveraging the power of our network because we have 80, 80 million merchants and we got 60,000 banks whose power we can bring it to the table and support, of course, WFA by signing the Planet Pledge, which we have done. So take a look at this video. It's beautiful. It's majestic. It's literally the most priceless thing there is. Protecting what's priceless is a job that belongs to each and every one of us. At MasterCard, we're tackling the challenge of climate change head on and creating opportunities for our 3 billion cardholders to make a difference now. We've committed to net zero emissions. We're investing in the Sustainability Innovation Lab to develop the climate change solutions of tomorrow, educating people about their carbon footprint to promote sustainable spending with our carbon calculator building donation solutions that make it easier for everyone to contribute, and working with partners to offer sustainable card materials with less waste. We're mobilizing the power and reach of our global network to unite companies, communities, and consumers around climate action to help build a prosperous and inclusive future for people and the planet. We'll continue to do our part but we need partners with big ideas to take meaningful action, like joining the Priceless Planet Coalition. The Priceless Planet Coalition, it's a beautiful idea around collaboration. Collaboration allows us to accelerate our impact. Sustainability is an increasingly important thing. It's imperative that we look to explore what solutions are out there today. We're right at the start of our journey and we're really excited about it. A growing number of partners working side by side with experts to restore 100 million trees in the places where reforestation matters most. Because nothing is more priceless than this planet we call home. Right, uh, this, is, this is a very uh, significant effort. And what I want to say is that, you know, uh, when, again, um, Sir John Haggerty has mentioned about you want to create movements what we have actually done very coincidentally is in 2014, till then our whole marketing approach is about priceless moments. We want to really create and curate priceless moments in people's lives. So from there, now we are actually talking about priceless movements. For example, we are partnering with Stand Up To Cancer Foundation. Not many of you know, applying the management methodologies and techniques in the world of researching for cancer drugs, we have already enabled the creation of eight new cancer drugs. You don't associate MasterCard with finding drugs for cancer, but that's exactly what we are trying to do and not sort of advertising because it will seem totally self-serving. But the point of why I'm stating it here is it's not only about your brand. Brand will eventually be recognized. Profits will follow. If you really passionately go through the purpose, you want to follow your North Star, identify the right causes, and then actually pursue that. And to me, I have been for 36 years in the field of marketing. This is by far the most exciting and inspiring moment because many things I used to dream about how marketing could be, should be done, et cetera, they all become reality today with the technology enablement we have, not to the exclusion of creativity, but to enhance creativity so long as you're imaginative. And uh, I know like Stefan has said, I feel very pleased about the book that I have written. And it's now been published in five languages. Nine more languages are coming in and uh, top schools in the world are now using my book as a reference. Uh, and they have actually, 220 colleges actually have already uh, jettisoned their old marketing curriculum and now they are following mark, uh, quantum marketing. So that's a big personal, uh, professional satisfaction for me. Uh, and uh, hopefully this is something which each one of you will read and I would love to engage with you. I've got those you know, Twitter handles and all these, would love to uh, connect with you all at some point in time, either digitally or in person. But thank you very much. I appreciate your patience. <laughs>